Welcome to today's Ask the Experts webinar, Navigating the SPAC Lifecycle Part 1, SPAC Formation and IPO. Well, today's discussion will focus on the very active formation and IPO stage in the SPAC Lifecycle. We will follow this up with Part 2 and Part 3 of our series, which will cover the DSPAC merger and life as a public company. Those webinars are scheduled for May 20th and June 10th. More on those later. Joining, joining me today are four experts in their fields. Michelle Leighton, Managing Director out of our Dallas office, with an emphasis on advising clients through the buy side and sell side action. Sasha Morozova, Managing Director out of our Atlanta office, leader in our capital markets and SPAC practice. Zach McGinnis, Managing Director out of our Houston office and head of our SPAC practice. Jason Lowe, Director out of our Chicago office, leading our valuation service. Thanks to each of you for presenting today. A couple of brief housekeeping matters that we'll cover to begin the webinar. Our webcasts are all recorded and available on our website, riveron.com. Today there will be four polling questions which are required for you to obtain CPE. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to use the Q&A function in Zoom for both technical issues or content-related questions. Webinar evaluation forms and CPE certificates will be emailed, typically within about a week. The on-demand video is not available for CPE. It's on our website, however, no CPE on the, the replay. You will receive a follow-up email after this webinar, which will include access to the webinar recording and the deck we're going to present today, the ability to join our webinar mailing list for future webinars, and presenter contact information. We begin today with our first polling question. Is your organization contemplating a transaction with a SPAC in the next a, zero to three months, B, three to six months, C, six to 12 months, or D, not at all. And while we wait for the, the feedback to come in, I have a fairly light question to, to ask our, our panelists. Who is your favorite celebrity SPAC sponsor? Sash, Sasha and Zach. Uh, for me, it would be uh, Richard Branson. Okay. Zach, how about you? I'm gonna go I'm gonna go with Alex Rodriguez, Michael. Yep. Plenty of options. Everyone's getting into the SPAC, so okay. Thank you. The so we've got a variety here, some not contemplating, but then pretty evenly spread out across the other buckets. So thank you for your feedback. Sasha, please um, start us off with some of the, the background and key attributes of SPACs. Thanks, Michael. So SPACs uh, have become the hottest thing in the finance over the past 15 months. Um, and what's interesting is that SPACs are not really new. They have been around for decades, and um, the first SPAC is dating back as far as 1933. SPACs turned hot for a brief periods of time in the 90s, and then they became popular again in the 2000s. And then they declined in popularity, mostly due to market crashes, and then um, the surge of traditional IPO came about. And then the SPAC craze began back in March last year um, as onset of pandemic closed the windows for traditional IPOs for at least a quarter. And uh, just to give you perspective how crazy SPACs became, uh, so in 2020 they actually represented about half of their all IPOs uh, with 270 Six packs going public, and when we we thought that uh, 2020 IPO activity was high, um, according to the PitchBook article, there were actually 329 SPAC IPOs through April 15th alone. Um, 
And uh, 118 SPACs closed the acquisition starting in 2020, representing about $120 billion in value that are now public. So pretty impressive numbers. So how are those entity structures and what is the underlying economics? Uh, so SPACs are essentially a newly formed entity whose sole purpose is to go out and find a private company to acquire and effectively take it public. And the way they do it is that they, at formation, the sponsors would uh, put initial seed money, and then there will be an IPO when the remaining of the proceeds will be collected. And in, the, in its really simplest form of an IPO, IPO it's really IPO in a shell company that has no operations, no assets, and its sole business purpose is to mainly go out and uh, find a target. And it usually takes about two years for them to do it, otherwise they will have to dissolve. So now going back to who are the SPAC sponsors, or the founders of those SPACs. So unlike in a traditional IPO where investors buy shares of actual companies, in a SPAC, the investors place their money in a blind pool and essentially placing complete faith into SPAC sponsors' ability to identify a suitable target to acquire. Uh, most of the time, SPAC sponsors are investment professionals, and they usually have very impressive and significant track record. Oftentimes, they are uh, well-known managers of large private equity funds. But sometimes, SPAC sponsors can also be celebrities. For example, former NBA star Sha Shaquille O'Neal has a SPAC, and so is uh, Jay-Z and Alex Rodriguez, as Zach noted, as his favorite SPAC. Um, so there's also so-called uh, serial uh, SPAC sponsors. And, uh, for example, one of them, billionaire investor Alex Gore, has formed uh, 13 SPACs to date. So that, that man is pretty busy. Um, the typical capital structure usually uh, starts with sponsors contributing nominal amounts to um, a SPAC upon its formation. Usually it's about $25,000 for Class B shares. And the shares are very similar to a carried interest that we typically see in a B fund. The shares give SPAC sponsors 20% ownership of a SPAC equity, which uh, goes without saying represents a very hefty upside to a SPAC sponsor if the transaction is successful. Uh, and this upside is really meant to compensate SPAC sponsors for identifying a target, doing the diligence, and closing the acquisition uh, with minimal upfront investment. So that can be a very attractive uh, proposition to them. At IPO, the units are sold uh, to other retail investors, and usually those units are called Class A units, which are sold at $10 per share, and they have a fractional warrant attached to them. Uh, following the IPO, you have two types of sponsors, uh, two types of investors, the sponsors and uh, other investors. The proceeds from the IPO that are raised during the I IPO process are segregated in a special uh, trust fund until those funds are ready to be deployed for an acquisition. Um, and to give you a relative uh, kind of understanding of the size of the raise, in 2020, the uh, average raise was about $280 million. So once the acquisition is identified, the negotiation process between SPAC and the target company begins. And at that stage, uh, if additional funding is needed, and oftentimes, uh, there is a shortfall between the funds raised in IPO and the ultimate purchase price of the company. There is additional funding that's raised through the pipe or uh, private investment in a public entity uh, to help uh, 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 fund the acquisition. And again, if investors ultimately decide that that acquisition is not worth pursuing, they can redeem their shares, uh, essentially forcing SPAC to either raise new funds within the two-year period, or if they approach in the two-year period that they have, they will have to dissolve. So now we have a good understanding of what uh, SPACs are. I wanted to spend a few minutes just talking about the differences between traditional IPO and a SPAC. So, so a question often uh, comes, you know, is there any similarities between the two? Because ultimately they accomplish the same goal, the taking private company uh, public. Well, those two mechanisms of taking companies public cannot, public cannot be uh, far apart from each other. They are different in economics, parties involved, and a general process. Starting with the timing of the transaction, the traditional IPO 
window open and close. So even if the company is uh, ready to go public, it really depends on the market conditions uh, for it ultimately uh, to be able to, to proceed with the transaction. In a SPAC, you really have a two-year time window to uh, complete the transaction. Um, traditional IPOs spend considerable time and money to market the transaction. Um, they usually engage with investors uh, in pre-trading roadshows to determine their interest. We, we call it uh, the testing the waters period. The SPACs uh, really don't have much marketing associated to them. It's really about the merge agreement between the SPAC and the target where the pricing is decided and the, the transaction either ultimately approved or not approved by the SPAC shareholders. In terms of compliance, SPACs, uh, can you imagine, a lot uh, more complicated um, in a compliance process. They first have to form an IPO, uh, form a public shell, then there is a proxy filing associated with, with the uh, acquisition of a target, and generally the, the documents that are filed uh, with SEC are a lot more complex. And lastly, as it relates to cost, uh, so SPACs usually don't have underwriting uh, fees involved uh, that are traditional for the IPO. In IPO, they're about 4 to 6% of the total proceeds earned. There's still underwriters involved in a SPAC, though, and also because SPACs go after the target that sometimes in the early stage that the companies that would uh, choose to go become public, a lot of uh, funds are spent on getting that target up to speed and um, being able to function as a public company. And now with that, uh, I'd like to, to pass it on to Zach to talk a little bit more about uh, trends in, in the current uh, SPAC market. Um, so, can you guys hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. Thanks, Zach. Okay, perfect. Um, so definitely, you know, the 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 SPAC SPAC mania continues. Um, you know, we we always get questions from our clients as to you know why or why is the SPAC vehicle so popular? Um, you know, in a COVID year, what we saw is a lot of our clients you know weren't super comfortable. Um, you know, taking some dry powder off the sidelines. Um, so, so the SPAC vehicle was really a uh, a tool to to invest with a management team, right? In a in a depressed um, in a depressed period. So, you know, that that's really one of the things that we've we've seen in practice. The the other thing is, you know, a lot of the big four accounting firms and law firms are, you know, finding the SPAC vehicle more acceptable. Um, back in the day, as Sasha was mentioning earlier, you know, these these vehicles were, uh, were were looked at, you know, as, as high risk because you weren't really sure, you know, what was what was on the balance sheet and what was off the balance sheet. So, um, you know, th this vehicle really is is becoming more and more acceptable to a lot of the big big four audit firms um, and then retail investors, right? So, uh, you know, typically in a traditional IPO, uh, you know, retail investors, mom and pop investors don't really get to participate. Um, in a pre-IPO company, so the SPAC vehicle, you know, through the uh, through the IPO is, is a good opportunity for for retail investors to really participate in in some of these um, companies going public that they otherwise uh, wouldn't wouldn't uh, have a chance in participating in. So, and then deal certainty and price certainty. So, in a, in a traditional IPO, there's a lot of you know at the end of the roadshow, call it the two-week roadshow. Um, the IPO price is a little bit of a surprise in a in a SPAC that kind of the M and A terms are set early on, so it, it does eliminate a little bit of the call it price uncertainty uh, in these types of transactions. So, just a few a few uh, I guess points points there as to, as to why these uh, these types of vehicles are becoming more and more accepted uh, in practice. On uh, on eight here, so. So this uh, this slide is really kind of the the four phases of a SPAC transaction. 
uh, what Michael was mentioning earlier, obviously the, the focus on this one is is on the formation and, and in financial statement um, prep. Uh, really, phase two is uh, around target identification. So one thing that we'll talk about here a little bit is is diligence. So buy side diligence uh, is is something that most most of our clients do in this in this phase when they're really shopping for a target. And what's interesting is target companies that are going into a SPAC nowadays. Um, are, are doing what's called a SPAC off and, and actually uh, doing reverse diligence on, on the SPAC itself. So uh, the target identification piece is, is, you know, typically after the IPO where, uh, you know, it could last 18 to 24 months uh, before, before the SPAC actually finds a target. Phase three is really kind of call it pre, pre-merger to where the target company needs to go through and get public ready, right? So not only the historical financial statements that go into the registration statement and MD&A and pro formas, um, but, but also kind of that, that readiness, that public company readiness um, piece is where, where we see a lot of our clients really struggle um, to, be able to, to be able to close the books in the, in the SEC reporting period. And then four is kind of the longer term tail um, around being a public company um, and closing the books faster, stronger. So, you know, as a firm, we, we typically will, will stick around with our clients for a couple quarters or even a couple years uh, until they can really kind of run on their own two feet there. So I'll hand it back to, uh, to Michael for polling question two. Thanks, Zach. And I think we're going to have to come up with a SPAC dictionary because you mentioned SPAC. There's a lot of terms in here. So we'll work on that on the side. But in the meantime, we'll go to polling question two. Who has historically technical accounting matters at your company, A, the accounting team in addition to their closed process, B, a separate technical accounting team or individual, C, an accounting firm other than the auditor. So I'll wait for the, the responses to come back there. Sasha, you mentioned the PE um, structure. Can you compare and contrast briefly the the PE structure versus a SPAC? Sure. So probably the main difference is that uh, in a P fund, uh, investors contribute to a fund, and those are then invested into a portfolio of companies. While in a SPAC, it's really kind of you put all your eggs in one basket. In terms of the compensation to uh, sponsors, then those are compensated. Uh, I think compensation is pretty similar with a carried interest or Class B shares in a, in a SPAC uh, scenario. Thanks, Sasha. Okay, so looks like folks are doubling up here with the majority of response coming in with um, the accounting team is handling it in addition to the closed process. So thank you very much. And Sasha, I think we're going to go back to you now for some of the formation uh, points in the IPO. Thanks, Michael. So although SPAC uh, financial reporting and general IPO process is not as complex as it would be for a traditional company, uh, the entity still has to go through the motion of regular IPO process uh, like everybody else. And um, the IPO uh, really starts about a month and a half uh, after the formation of the SPAC. And just a reminder, that formation, that's where uh, SPAC sponsors uh, contribute their initial capital. And about a month and a half, the IPO starts. And usually that process takes about six weeks between the SEC review of uh, registration statements and ultimately that registration uh, becoming public. And oftentimes, um, there's a lot of pressure to to get this process done sooner than later, as obviously SPAC sponsors want to start deploying the capital and start looking at the potential targets. So with that in mind, Zach, I was wondering if you can maybe spend a few minutes uh, providing kind of your thoughts on what we've seen, um, a success story for SPAC that was just formed, how they can go through this process in an effective and efficient manner? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and, and I would say if, if, if there are folks on the, on the phone that are, that are forming a new SPAC, um, where we've seen things go well and not so well is um, making sure that the, the sponsor, um, you know, comes up with a business case and forms the entity before, you know, they get 
other uh, advisors involved. Um, where, where we've seen some inefficiencies is where the, the sponsor kind of didn't know who they wanted to be when they grew up, and they they shifted shifted a few times during the formation um, the formation phase. So I think the key thing here is um, you know set your business objective, get get the entities formed, get the bank statement funded, um, and then you know a firm like us and the attorneys then can start on building the S one and the financial statements that go into the registration statement. Great, thanks. Um, and now we just wanted to highlight uh, a few uh, areas that we uh, came across as could be uh, a, a little bit complex for for the SPACs. So again, it's it's not really a lot of accounting issues associated with it, but just to name a few, um, for example, directly attributable offering costs, um, it's just important to track those carefully uh, because they would be uh, recorded as offset to equity as opposed to uh, expenses incurred in the P&L. Also, you probably heard uh, in, the, in the news, and most of you probably heard that uh, SEC has been uh, very focused on treatment of warrants uh, uh, and looking at more closely at the warrant agreements uh, related to public and, and private placement warrants, as um, most of them uh, have terms that would require classification on the liability section of the balance sheet as opposed to equity. So that's something that I think most SPACs uh, have to consider anywhere from formation through through even the SPACs that are effective and already have uh, merged with the targets. Uh, and we will spend a little bit more time on this topic uh, shortly. Other areas uh, that I'd like to highlight is just always thinking of uh, cash flow presentations, specifically looking at disclosing any non-cash activity. And once the IPO is effective, uh, thinking through the EPS presentation using a two-class method. Uh, but again, it's, it's not a lot of complexity involved. It's just a lot of things uh, to consider in a short period of time upon formation and IPO process. Yeah, and Sasha, um, just and to now, add, yeah. yeah, just to add, I mean, obviously the, the SPAC clock is 18 to 24 months, as, as you mentioned earlier. You know, we, we did see one deal a few years ago that <laughs> the, the sponsor ran out of time and, and the deal actually uh, fell through because, you know, certain things weren't really uh, prepared early on in the process. So, so one thing that we, we are seeing more in the, in the, with sponsors that are forming these new SPACs now is they're actually starting the diligence pretty soon in that 24-month clock um, because the, the time pressure is definitely on uh, to close the deal versus a traditional IPO that could take three or four years and you're not really on the clock with a SPAC, you, you, you most definitely have that, that clock. So um, just some, something to consider is, is diligence, buy-side financial diligence, operational diligence early on in that process is, um, is the secret to success there. So. Thanks, Ad. That's very helpful. And I'd also, do you just want to maybe go over um, the sections of the registration statement uh, and also discuss where we um, and uh, accounting advisors uh, get involved? Yeah, for sure. So, so this slide really is kind of a call it a table of contents for an S1. Uh, it's a slide that we regularly put in um, decks when we're we're going through with with sponsors, with with regards to who does what. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, our our role as an accounting advisor um, generally relate to you know financial data disclosures, um, you know, historical financial statements. Um, so 19, obviously, five and six, the cap and dilution table has a few nuances um, with respect to how the math is done uh, in this particular type of type of transaction. The, the attorneys are obviously going to drive the bus um, and, and, and control the control the registration statement in, in, um, in total, and then obviously the auditors are going to are going to come behind on 19 and, and audit the financial statements. So. Um, this is something that it's a good slide just to kind of show roles and responsibilities uh, with respect to who, who kind of who's doing what, right? So. Yeah, so Zach, I think, Michael. Yep, yep, and I think that that last slide really shows kind of the need to get organized, right? Because you've got so many people playing in the sandbox, so you just you got to be very coordinated and and synced with with all the professionals involved. Yes, point point question number three. And I guess before I do that, can I just remind, we've had a couple of folks raise their hand. That 
if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A function, and we'll, we'll get to your questions at the end um, as time permits. So please use the Q&A function. Polling question number three. Would your company be prepared to operate as a public company if acquired by a SPAC? A, yes, with minimal uplift. B, maybe. We have good processes, but we'll need to make some adjustments. C, no, our accounting and finance team is very lean. D, not sure, we need to perform an assessment. So I think, Zach, you, you talked about the SPAC clock, I think, in, in one of your earlier comments. And I think, can you just share a little bit of the evolution? How has the SPAC IPO timeline uh, evolved over the last year or so as the market has moved to the SPAC vehicle? Yeah, it's it's definitely getting a lot faster, right? I mean, I, I would say in our experience, you know, we need a week, the auditors need a week, uh, the company usually starts in week zero to to form form the entity. So usually about, you know, three weeks. Back in the day, maybe a year or two ago, it was much less efficient. It may it may have taken a month or two to actually get that first S one on file. So I think the the industry is getting a lot more efficient. Um, you know, absent the warrant issue that we're going to talk about here in a little bit, but. Um, I think the the process has has definitely become uh, faster and faster. On the DSPAC side, which we'll talk about in a subsequent webinar, uh, I saw an interesting article in PitchBook that you know the the DSPACs actually have gotten to like seven to eight months um, from from 24 months, uh, you know, over the last couple of years. So even on on the back end of the transactions, um, you know, sponsors and target companies are are becoming more and more efficient in these in these vehicles. Yeah, for sure. And I think we've seen even just this year, there's been a shrinkage in the timeline. So that makes sense. Okay. Um, thank you for your polling question responses. And, and this is, you know, pretty weighted towards, um, you know, having a, a lean team and, and, and not sure needing to, to perform an assessment. So not too surprising with the response. Okay, so Zach, you mentioned the, the warrant accounting treatment, and the SEC shook things up, I think it was April 12th, um, three or four weeks ago, when they provided some input on, on how the warrant should be accounted. So we'll talk about that and, and how that's rippled through and some of the, the, the trends that we're seeing in the, the SPAC IPO space right now. Um, and you'll start us with warrant. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I'll, I'll lean into to Jason as well on the next slide. But, you know, the, the SEC threw us a nice curveball about a month ago um, to where, you know, warrants generally were classified as equity uh, for the last seven or eight years. I think it's over probably seven or 800 SPACs that have applied the same kind of, you know, industry and regulatory approved uh, accounting policy of, of equity classification. The, the, the SEC came back about a month ago and said, well, not so much. Um, if there's any, you know, settlement feature that that uh, could could be settled in cash, uh, it's an indication that these warrants should be liability classified, even if it's let's say one percent, very unlikely uh, to be settled in cash. Um, that they came back and said, no, we're going to challenge that. I think the the genesis was one of the big four firms sent in a letter to the SEC and and started to challenge the the accounting policy for. Or the balance sheet classification for these for these instruments. So, um, so right now, you know, over the last three or four weeks, uh, sponsors and attorneys and audit firms have really rallied together to come up with, you know, kind of a consistent accounting methodology. Jason will talk about the the valuation technique that that is going to be used to value these public and and private warrant agreements. But um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of sponsors are having to go back and restate all their historical financial statements, even for companies that have de spacs You know, a few of our clients, you know, de spacked in 2019 or, and, um, or in 2020, and they're having to go back as well and determine if, from a SAB 99 standpoint, if, if it's a big R, little R, and what's the fair value at each of those, each of those uh, reporting dates. So it's definitely been an exciting time to, to be alive as an accounting professional, um, and see how see over the last three or four weeks how this has really evolved. But um, at the end of the day, you know, post IPO stacks, they're kind of it's too late for them, so they've got to go back and restate and determine the fair value at each reporting period. For pre-IPO stacks, uh, you know, conversations that we're having is you know, 
do you want to go faster and be liability classified, you know, assuming the same warrant agreement terms, or do you want to revise your warrant agreements and, and try to maintain that equity classification? So it seems, I don't know, two-thirds are, are kind of picking liability <laughs> um, and dealing with the economic disadvantages of, of being a liability classified SPAC going into a DSPAC transaction. Um, definitely lean on my investment banking friends to, to articulate you know, the, the downside of, of being a liability classified SPAC. But um, at the end of the day, you know, what we typically would do is, is help uh, a sponsor write an accounting policy, and then I'll hand the mic over to Jason to, to kind of talk about where the world is from a valuation standpoint. But these warrants, if liability classified, have to be fair valued each, each reporting period. So think, you know, the initial AK, and then each quarter thereafter uh, with, with any changes in fair value going through the, uh, through the income statement. So... Jason, I'll give the, the mic to you to go through kind of evaluation, um, evaluation approaches for these uh, warrants. Sure. Thanks, Zach. Yeah, it's exciting time to be alive for a uh, valuation professional trying to, to sort through all these things. Um, yeah, to say the, the warrants, you know, the, the reclassification from equity to liability has been disruptive is uh, a bit of an understatement. You know, as you mentioned, people are going back as far as 2019 to have to restate their financials. And then essentially it's putting the brakes on the IPO process as people you know, have to work through these issues. So what makes this interesting from a valuation perspective, if you think about the, the value of the, the share or the unit at the IPO, you, you really have a, a company or a, a share of stock that has no underlying operations. So you kind of understand that the, the warrant is, or the, the unit is issued for um, you know, a share of stock and a fractional warrant, um, but you really don't know what the operations of the company are going to be or what the cash flows of the company are going to be. So some of the, the SPACs might have an investment thesis where they're saying, well, we're going to invest in a certain industry or clean energy or a certain technology, but even uh, more so, they're, they're generally broadly worded. So you really don't know what the operating company is going to be. So that definitely creates a challenge as we think about the, the valuation process. So if we just walk through the features of the different um, types of warrants and, and kind of the initial unit. So there's the public and private warrants, but it really all starts out with the, the, the unit. So when a unit is issued, it's a share of stock and a fraction of the warrant. And usually that fraction and most of the deals we've seen are about a third, you know, but it does vary up or down from that. And that is issued, that share and that fraction of a warrant is issued for $10. So that fraction of a warrant is essentially what we consider to be the public warrant. So it has an exercise price of $11.50. And the unique feature here is that it has a call provision. And the way the agreements are typically worded is that any sort of, um, once the share price reaches $18 and it trades above that or around that um, on a 20 day basis out of 30 days, then it is callable by the company. So if you think about that, um, for, from a holder of that warrant, you're essentially kind of capped in terms of how much that warrant can be worth because the company could call it at $18. So you're kind of limited uh, in the value there. On the private side, um, you know, same exercise price, $11.50. Uh, here you can't exercise the private warrants until 30 days after the business combination has been affected. And generally there's not this call provision. Um, as long as you're the original holder of the warrant, um, the agreements defined who you can transfer the warrants to, the, the private warrants to. Um, but if you um, transfer the warrant outside of that, that defined population, then you're subject to that $18 call provision as well. So if you think about the public and the private warrants, because there's this cap of $18 on the public side, the private warrants should be worth more than the public warrants. So that all being said, there are agreements that we're seeing more recently where there's uh, a provision in there that applies to the private warrants that says, you know, if the stock is trading between $10 and $18, that it is callable by the company. However, there's a make whole provision. So it really doesn't make economic sense for the companies to call in those warrants unless that share price has met that $18. So in those situations where these call provisions and make whole provisions apply to the private warrants, that val the value of the public and private warrants are the same. They're on equal footing because they're sort of both capped at that $18 mark. So with that as a backdrop, you know, we'll walk through an example of how we would typically value a warrant, um, kind of in a plain vanilla type scenario, and we'll compare and contrast how we 
the, the inputs to what we would have here and some of the difficulties in how we approach these valuations. So, you know, thinking about the handful of inputs for uh, a warrant valuation, if you're familiar with the Black-Scholes approach, um, you know, there, there's essentially five key, um, key inputs. Time for these warrants would be five years. That's a contractual period from the time the business combination uh, is in effect. You have five years uh, to the end of the term. The strike price, as we mentioned, is $11.50. The risk-free rate over that term, that five-year term, easily obtainable from public information. And then where it gets more difficult is volatility and share price. So when we're thinking about the um, volatility, if you were valuing a traditional public company that's an operating company, you, know, you could look to the public markets and look at comparable companies in terms of similar industry operations and size and use that Stock, their stock price volatility as a proxy for the private. Here at IPO, we don't really have that benefit because we don't know what the underlying operations is or what the business combination, what type of company it would necessarily be. We can't obviously rely on historical information uh, because there's no trading volume at that point in time. So here what we're doing for the volatility is we're looking at recent um, SPAC transactions, so companies that have IPO'd and the warrants and the shares are publicly traded, and we're looking at the implied volatility and using that in our as the volatility in our analysis. On the share price, we have the same sort of issue. We don't know the share price directly because when the uh, unit is issued, it, the $10 represents the share and the fraction of a warrant. Um, so traditional private company, you would do a, a, a enterprise valuation using a discounted cash flow analysis or um, sort of a market approach um, to come up with what that total enterprise population would be. And then you can allocate that to the different classes of equity. Um, so here, what we have to do is really solve for what that share price is going to be. Um, so if you look at the slide, you know, what we're going to talk through here is an a uh, scenario where there's no call option. So there's no call option on the private warrant. So there's a difference between the, the public and the private warrant values. So what we're doing initially is we're, we're using a Monte Carlo simulation. So the Monte Carlo simulation is simulating the stock price on a daily basis over the term of the warrant. And what we're simulating here in, in a Monte Carlo simulation, we typically run about 100,000 iterations, but with any one given iteration, what we're looking at is if, based on the volatility and the share price, would it trigger that $18 call provision? And if it does trigger that in one iteration, we would essentially say the value is at that $18 mark. If the simulation runs and it doesn't reach that threshold, then we're assuming that it's um, being held to the end of the term and that the, whatever that ending price at the end of the simulation would be uh, what would be used in the, the, the black shoals. So here, be, as we do this, and we do it, you know, like I said, 100,000 times, um, what, we, what we do know is that the share and the fraction warrant should equal back to $10. So we're running this iteration or the, the Monte Carlo simulation multiple times so that as, it, as we continue to refine the inputs, that we get to a share price and a fraction of a warrant that equals $10. From there to value the private warrants because they don't have this cap feature of the $18 in this example, we're using the inputs that are a result of that Monte Carlo simulation as an input into the black shoal. So we're using that share price that is uh, derived from the simulation uh, in our black shoals calculation and coming up with the value of the private warrants then. Like I said before, the, the value of the private warrants when there's no call feature is generally coming out a little higher than the value of the public warrants. So the way the agreements are structured, the, the, the unit at IPO essentially detaches. So there is a, uh, after 52 days, there will be a publicly traded share and there will be a publicly traded warrant. So from a financial reporting purpose, uh, you have a level one input. You can go out assuming there's active trading activity um, and use that as a direct input into what the value of the public warrant would be. And in the private warrants, um, what you would have to do is use the share price and the implied volatility from those trades as the inputs into the private warrants. Um, if there is that call feature on the private warrants, essentially the, the process we talked about on the public warrants would yield the same value for the private warrants. So essentially you're coming to one value. 
And then once they detach, um, you can use that level one input and just say, you know, assume that the public and the private warrants are the same. So there's no further analyses in terms of a black holes um, needed. Now I can say that this, you know, it's been, I think three weeks now and it's evolved quite a bit from where we started, um, you know, as we work with our clients, um, talk to other valuation firms as well, you know, just understanding that everything is really sort of kind of triangulating to this methodology and the audit team seem to be uh, on board as well. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Zach to talk about the, the hot topics. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Um, so Sasha was mentioning earlier allocation of offering costs. So this is a, a hot topic of the last few weeks. Um, since, since warrants are now going to be bifurcated into the liability section of the balance sheet, um, you know, many of the audit firms are are requesting that there is some level of at least pro rat allocation of deferred offering costs to the warrants. And so one thing that we're going through now with our clients is is helping them establish, uh, you know, their accounting policies uh, for for that allocation. Because uh, generally back in the day, you know, the last seven or eight years, um, all those costs just kind of got hung up on the balance sheet and then got offset to equity uh, when the IPO actually took place. So um, kind of a new new accounting issue that's come up because of the warrant uh, the warrant issue. So something to to keep in mind uh, if you if you're going through this process. And then forecast, um, you know, this is a, a hot topic for the SEC. They they really don't like <laughs> they don't like uh, you know SPACs in the pipe 8K having to put in certain um, forecasted financial data. Uh, you know, the perception is that those those forecasts are a little aggressive, and it exposes the the retail investor to uh, to overly aggressive forecasts. And one of the one of the things that the the staff are picking on is um, is that forecasted information contrasted to a traditional IPO, where you generally don't, unless you're an MLP or some other interesting vehicle, uh, you wouldn't have any any um, perspective information uh, in, in the document. So. Uh, just something to keep in mind that you know these forecast the SEC is definitely challenging the forecast and you know keeping keeping trying to keep sponsors um, SPAC sponsors honest right with uh, with any future data so um, I'll give it to I believe Michelle uh, for the next section thanks Zach um, so over the weekend PitchBook published its second quarter SPAC update these figures are as of April fifteenth. In 2020 and through the first quarter of this year, $212 billion were raised from 605 SPAC IPOs. And while there are a few large outliers, the median SPAC size is around $250 million. As Sasha said earlier, the pace of activity continues to increase and the number of Q1 IPOs actually surpassed all of 2020 by 19.8%. During the past five quarters, 118 SPAC acquisitions were closed. Now, while some of those may relate to IPOs from before 2020, this still tells us that hundreds of SPACs still need to close a deal. Now, um, new IPOs are outpacing the closing of DSPAC transactions, which means more and more SPACs will be hunting for targets as the year progresses. And the average tar target valuation has been almost four times the SPAC IPO size, which means a $250 million SPAC is often looking for a $1 billion private company. So what do all of these stats tell us? When you step back and look at those points, we see that there's a lot of pressure mounting on SPAC sponsors to close a deal. And as Sasha and Zach talked about earlier, SPACs have up to 24 months to complete the transaction. So sponsors are aggressively searching for targets and are moving very quick to close. PitchBook reported that the median timeline between IPO and DSPAC is about seven and a half months and that timeline is expected to significantly shorten in 2021, given the uptick of the IPO activity. Some critics, including some concerns that were recently um, coming out of the SEC, wonder if this pressure disincentivizes sponsors from conducting a proper level of diligence. It's a very valid concern if you consider shareholder value and their interests. So how does a SPAC get to close? Well, SPAC sponsors are looking for a company in a specific industry that are of a certain size or in a certain valuation range, but sponsors may also find other positives that are intriguing, such as a high functioning management team that could lead the company for the foreseeable future, or the ability of a company to quickly grow organically or by acquisition. 
And while a sponsor may know exactly what they're looking for, it isn't quite that straightforward. Not only are these sponsors competing with all these other SPACs for their ideal target, PEs who currently are working with an unprecedented level of dry powder are completely completing more buyouts than ever before, especially in the tech space, which is where SPACs have shown a whole lot of interest. Once the sponsor has narrowed down the field and signed an LOI, its buy-side diligence process begins. And at a minimum, buy-side diligence consists of financial, tax, and legal diligence, which are performed by third-party specialists. And IT and operational diligence are also growing in popularity as well. Once um, the diligence process kind of wraps up, if a reps and warranties policy is applied, the diligence teams will support the sponsor to work to get that, that policy secured. Along the way, the, the, the M&A attorneys are drafting and tweaking uh, the purchase agreement, and the sponsor gains shareholder pro approval for ultimately uh, closing up the deal. So which areas do we focus on during buy-side diligence? Financial, tax, and IT, all of which Riveron routinely performs, work in tandem during the exclusivity period after the LOI is signed. Legal diligence is performed by a law firm that specializes in M&A or corporate work and runs concurrently with those other diligence streams. And while financial diligence most directly ties to supporting the sponsor's valuation of a target, the non-financial areas that we mentioned, as well as others, can be equally as important. Um, together, all of these help a sponsor or any other buyer, for that matter, negotiate various deal points and mitigate risks that can come up during diligence before closing. And while the most common bust from financial diligence efforts um, really relate to surprises from like EBITDA analyses or cash flow analyses, um, issues brought to light from some of these other um, non-financial areas can be just as much of a deal killer. I've seen tax issues um, related to sales and use or a busted S-corp status or treatment issues cause significant headaches leading, leading up to close. And IT diligence may find something like um, a target's infrastructure not being scalable for the company's next stage of life, which could require significant capital investments um, to overcome. And on the legal front, as you can imagine, there's a whole host of issues that can arise. So aside from identifying a deal killer, what are our takeaways from buy-side diligence? Most often, a buyer is looking to support a valuation, which again is likely tied to a quality of earnings analysis. The quality of earnings or QOV or QOE as it's called, is simply a calculation of adjusted EBITDA. And adjusted EBITDA aims to act as a proxy, acts as a proxy for um, normalized earnings and it adjusts for any extraordinary or non-recurring income or expense items that are recorded on the P&L. Um, aside from the QOV, networking capital, and free cash flow analyses are incredibly important. Um, understanding the cash flow conversion within the networking, um, cash conversion cycle within the networking capital analyses is um, key to understanding the company's performance. And identifying debt like items or tax exposures will give the sponsor the insight to properly negotiate or remediate any of these concerns before closing. On a more qualitative side, um, assessing the target's accounting and finance function is extremely important, um, especially for SPACs. As Zach mentioned, it will be imperative to understand the quality of data, the capabilities of the accounting and finance team, the alignment of the current policies and processes to GAAP, and then the strength of the company's financial reporting function. And this assessment should provide a sponsor with an understanding of any gaps between the company's current state versus what will be required of it as a public company. Um, reps and warranties policies have gained popularity over the past few years for buyers, and these are especially, especially um, interesting for SPACs. Uh, these policies essentially ensure that, that um, there's accuracy in the rep representations made by a seller. And in doing that, they kind of act like a security blanket of sorts and tend to expedite the close process. Due diligence is required by these um, underwriters and the service providers that do the other diligence um, processes um, assist the, the sponsor to get the calls and presentations required by the underwriter um, to secure these policies. And once all this wraps up, shareholder approval is needed to complete the deal. So now I believe Michael has polling question number four. Thank you, Michelle. Correct, um, and thank you to the, the the presenters all for for jumping on and going through this. So we'll we'll end here with point question number four, and then we'll get into some Q and A. Um, 
And if we don't get to all the Q&A, then we will follow up with, with you um, afterward directly. So thank you. Does your company have valuations performed by third parties? A, yes, annually. B, yes, as needed. C, no, we calculate fair value in-house. And D, and A. So now we've had the celebrity question come up. So now I'm going to ask the panelists who, if you could pick, would be your favorite celebrity to form a SPAC? Start with Michelle. Oh gosh, um, I I don't know. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Beyonce so she can rival Jay Z's. Uh, All right, Jason. I'm gonna go in the same spirit and say Kanye. Okay, Sasha. Well, I have no choice but J Lo. <laughs> Back. I'm gonna continue the baseball theme and say Jose Altuve, the second baseman for the Houston Astros. I'm going to go with Tony La Russa, the White Sox manager. So, All right, good stuff. Thank you. All right, so now we'll, we'll answer a couple of the, the Q&A that came in. And I think the first one is, I'll, I'll just respond to, what is the percentage of SPACs formed without a specific acquisition target in mind? And I would say that's probably the norm. Um, they typically have an investment thesis where they're looking at an industry, a certain size, management team, something along those lines, but um, but I don't I don't think it's often that they have a specific target. So um, the next one that comes in, Sasha, how many years of audit financial statements are needed at the time of an IPO for an emerging growth company? And is it different if the EGC merges with a SPAC? So a two part question. Yeah, so I think it's a great question and um, not a, not a very straightforward answer. Generally, yes. So it's two two years for EGC when IPO happens. Generally, two years in a in a SPAC scenario when the S4 is filed. However, if SPAC has filed a 10K before that, then that could be a three-year requirement. Also, it's important to consider the small reporting entity reporting requirements as well. And lastly, we've seen a lot of SPACs because they have so much infusion of capital, um, they can quickly trip the EGC status. So that's also another complexity that has to be considered. Yeah, that really that really comes into play, um, especially if you have to have that third year, even as an EGC, uh, assuming you're not SRC, because um, it really it'll it'll impact the timeline quite significantly if you have to have you know, if you're following today, 20s, 19s, and 18s, it, it, it really is a burden for a lot of companies. Exactly. Just the SRC, the shortcut there is small reporting company, and they, they are allowed to stick to two years, right? They don't get kicked into that yep. three-year bucket. Yep. That, I mean, yeah. What, what we've it, learned this year yeah. is, yeah, if you're SRC, even if the SPAC has already followed its first K, you're capped at two as an SRC. So kind of getting into the weeds, obviously, but just make sure that, you know, step one is is to build up the basis of presentation, agree with the auditors uh, before you get too far down the road, because you could really you could do too much work and or not enough, right? Uh, depending on your yep. your circumstances. So. Okay, a couple a couple of other questions that came in. One is easy. Um, who do we contact if we want to reach out and, and work with uh, on a SPAC? So you can reach out to any of the presenters here. Uh, we're all on our website, riveron.com. Look us up. Uh, we'll send out the deck and the information, which will have our, our contact information as well. So please reach out to any of us. Um, and then a, a bit more of a nuanced question, Jason. I think I'll go with you, and maybe you'll have to keep it a little bit general about what you're seeing. But the question is, what is a typical breakdown of the unit value? Equity, 950, warrants, 50 cents. So maybe you could speak to what you're seeing. Yeah, you know, it really depends on where you're at in kind of the life cycle. So if you think back to the restatement and in the initial IPO, um, you know, we're, we're going back to like nine, 2019, you're seeing different volatilities. Uh, and then that obviously changes as you go forward. Um, we're working right now with several clients that are in the IPO process. So what we're seeing there is generally the share price is about you know, 970 or so, and then the um, balance would be to the, the fractional warrant. But it, it does vary depending on the time and the volatility and everything else we're, we're looking at. Okay. Thank you. 
so just to wrap up, um, like I said earlier, we do have a couple of webinars in this series uh, following that we'll add on. More will be the DSPAC merger, so where the SPAC merges with an operating company. That session will be on Thursday, May 20th at 12 p.m. Eastern. Again, you'll, you'll get an e email or an invite. You can register right now for it. Uh, the next one is on the post-close and what it means to be a public company. So a lot of the companies right now going through this back merger are early stage companies and being a public company is a big lift for them. So we'll talk about some of the, what we're seeing there, where they're struggling, some of the levers they can pull to make it easier. That is on June 10th, uh, Thursday, 12 p.m. So thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate spending an hour with you and hope you'll come back on the May 20th and June 10th for, for the next phase. Here's some thought leadership pieces that we put out over the last couple of weeks uh, with regard to SPAC, uh, the SPAC environment, and some of the SEC guidance on the accounting. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your day, and we hope to talk again soon. Bye-bye.